Welcome to SGS Arts. So today I'm gonna do a response video to Solitary Rolling Films, who did a video about his top 25 films of the 2010s. So I decided that it would be fun to do my own list, even though doing these rankings is so hard and takes quite a lot of time. But I ended up creating this ranking, although don't take the ranking too seriously, as I think it could be different tomorrow. And especially as probably half of this list I desperately need to rewatch as well. So some of those films might be worse on a rewatch, or they might be better on a rewatch. It's hard to say. And the first 23 films of my ranking are on my favorite films list, but then that last two are kind of near favorites, so they aren't on my favorites list, although they definitely could be after a rewatch, but we'll see. But as, as I'm show, showing this from Letterboxd, I'm actually going to go through in the order that I'm going to start with my number one favorite, and then we are going to go down. Yeah. But we are going to start with Twin Peaks The Return. Surprise, surprise, David Lynch is number one. Um, and you might say that it's, it's a TV show, but even in the sight and sound list, they included this. So I'm, I think of it as a long film. So, yeah. But this is one of David Lynch's best things. Just like many of his other works, it's a perfect combination of like great humor, weirdness, quirkiness, and then really disturbing stuff. Like, for example, the I Got a Light scene, and obviously the ending is very disturbing. Kyle MacLachlan is absolutely insanely good in this as he plays these different roles. Again, the doppelganger you see here, Bob, and then he plays the Ducky character, and then he plays himself, uh, Agent Cooper as well. So, yeah, what a great performance, and many other great performances. I love the kind of the, the casino mobsters, and they are really funny as well. And there are many like the small moments in the show that are so great. Yeah, this is a, such an enjoyable ride. It starts quite slow, so it might be a bit hard to get into at first, but then when it picks up, you really kind of get into it and start loving it. Yeah, all the episodes are good and great use of music as always. Too, and yeah, it was such a great way to get back into this world after a long break. Yeah. Another masterpiece. Then we have the Yorgos Lantimos film The Lobster, which I think is such an incredible work. One of my top 50 films of all time, maybe even top 30. I've watched it three times. It's just so incredibly funny and weird, and I love the very creative concept that these people who are single, who aren't in romantic relationships, they are sent into this hotel to find a new partner and if they cannot find a new partner in 45 days they are transferred tra transformed into like an animal of their own choosing so the name of the film is the lobster because the colin farrell character if he doesn't find a partner wants to be transformed into a lobster but of course the type of humor that this film has is something that many people won't find funny but to me, it's the, exactly the type of humor that I like. It's very dry, it's very dark and weird. And yeah, there are so many scenes in this film that absolutely make me laugh. Even near the end, when Colin Farrell eyes in the restaurant with the Rachel Weiss character, and he's like, Yeah, you went blind, and I'm gonna go blind too. And yeah, it's just <laughs> so fucked up, but so funny at the same time. And it has so, such a beautiful. Like visual style as well, very methodical, great shots in this film. And I love the stuff in the hotel, but I also love the stuff that happens after the hotel. And yeah, such a great movie. This would be a great discussion for the podcast at some point. I'm not sure whether Altes has seen this one or, or, or not. Yeah. I think this was Ro Ronin's actually number one, but yeah. 
I mean, it would be my number one if I didn't count Twin Peaks Return as a film, so yeah. Then why don't you play in hell by Sion Sono? I've talked about this many times. It's my favorite Sono film, although it's kind of tied with love exposure. But this is an utterly insane film. It's about these young wannabe filmmakers, and then it's about these Yakuza people, and then their paths cross. And this is quite violent, but it's also very comedic. It has this kind of a meta element in the end. That really makes the movie, in my opinion. But it's all about also kind of what filmmaking is and our love of films and things like that. So it's something that film lovers can really relate to. Um, but yeah, this would be another one for the podcast. But yeah, it's such a great and fun film. Yeah. Then another film that I've talked about many times, it's Like Father, Like Son by Hirokachu Koreda. It might be my favorite Koreda film, it's hard to say. But it's about these two families who had these boys at the same time, but they were actually swapped in the hospital. So the boys actually grew up in the wrong families, but then they find out later on. And then there is, of course, these weird conflicts and dynamics between all these people. And the family on the left is this kind of bourgeoisie family, and then the family on the right is this kind of working class family. So there's this kind of class battle in there, and this film discusses class as well, as well as what constitutes a family. Does biology have to play a part in a family and things like this? And this character, this kind of rich guy, is my favorite character, even though he's kind of an asshole, but I think he has an interesting character arc and such a great performance and yeah, he's an architect, kind of a workaholic and really tough father, but then the working class father is more of that kind of nice guy type, yeah. But it's a really beautiful slice of life, slice of life, low key film that has so, such emotional power in it, yeah really want to make you emotional yeah yeah and that is will be talked about in the podcast as well yeah then we have andrew hayes weekend which i've watched three times and it's a social realist film about these two gay guys who meet and they have this short romance for a weekend but then one of them it's actually about to move to America. So the romance isn't that long standing, but it kind of shows how you can fall in love very quickly and find this human connection very quickly. And these two guys are very different from each other. One of them is this kind of more outgoing, kind of artistic type, and the one of them is a bit more reserved and introverted. But they, um, really like each other and they go well together even though they're quite different and yeah this is a very emotional film very relatable film for me with exploration of a gay relationship and i mean andrew hay himself is gay so he knows what he's talking about so yeah what a great great movie absolutely love this one Then we have one of my absolute favorite animated movies. It's a silent voice by Naoko Yamada. I've also talked about this. But it's all about bullying and then also about social anxiety and the effects of bullying and things like that. There are lots of things in this film that I could really relate to. Thus I had such a like very deep emotional and personal connection to the film and that's why I love it and that's why I probably cannot Look at the film, quote unquote, objectively, and so I have such a deep personal connection to it that kind of makes my the critical part of my brain go to sleep, I guess. Yeah. But this will be talked about on the podcast as well. I just got this on Blu-ray actually, uh, and Altes also got it on Blu-ray. So it's just a matter of time when we talk about it on the podcast. So yeah, it's such a 
beautiful film, visually too, absolutely perfect uh, cinematog or not cinematography, but animation. And I think there's these like very creative ways of how they, for example, show social anxiety through the visuals. I don't want to spoil it, but it's very brilliant, I think. Yeah, but a beautiful movie. Although there are some critiques of the film that I can kind of understand why people would have those critiques, but, but I just absolutely adopt this film. I connected to the characters and the story. Yeah. Then we have my favorite Shinua Chukamoto film. It's Kotoko, all about mental illness. It's about this woman that you see here and her troubles with mental illness. And she tries to can feel something by like hurting herself. And she tries to kind of stick to reality by hurting herself. She has hallucinations and stuff. She has like really severe mental illness. So it's a very difficult film to watch. And it has that kind of crazy Tsukamoto visual style, lots of handheld. And it's kind of a cheap looking cinematography, but it actually fits this film really well as the cinematography kind of really kind of fits the mental illness that the cinematography feels like kind of her state of mind in a way as it kind of goes all over the place just like her mind does but yeah such a hard hitting emotional film hard to watch but very much worth watching yeah then we have xavier dolan's lawrence anyways which is about a character's um kind of discovery of themselves and it's about this transgender woman who starts going through the transition which obviously is very difficult especially as that person um was in a relationship with the, with with this woman but then the woman has to deal with her partner being trans and stuff so there's this very interesting uh, relationship dynamics that develop throughout this almost three hour long we film. Yeah. I know some people are very critical of this as uh, especially many trans people are very critical of this as again, no trans people were involved in making this film and it feels like maybe the portrayal of being trans isn't as good in this film as it could be. And I totally get that. And I can see that as well, but I think the film itself is just so well made and I had such an emotional connection to it that, that I can kind of look past that problematic side of the film, but I can totally understand why some people cannot do that. And I think that's a valid approach with watching a film like this, but, but I still really loved it. Yeah. Great performances, great score, beautiful visuals. Yeah. I really love this film, but again, I can understand the critiques. Then we have Whiplash, one of the more mainstream films on this list. Yeah, this one I have seen seven times. It's like insanely rewatchable film. I love the J.K. Simmons performance. I, for some reason, often find lots of humor in those types of asshole performances. And obviously, I think many people can find humor in, in him specifically. As some of his like lines are just absolute gold. <laughs> yeah. But of course, it's like uh, about this toxic relationship between this young drummer and this young teacher, not young, but old teacher, who is this hard ass. And then there's this commentary at that weather. That type of relationship is actually beneficial or not. And I know many jazz people don't like this film because it maybe puts jazz education and stuff like that in the wrong light. And I think there is like interesting commentary here about like the value of art as well. Like there's this dinner table scene when our main character is talking about like his jazz career, but then there are these two other young guys talking about their football career and maybe the many people 
appreciate like being a good football player can american football more than being a great jazz musician even though i think sensible people can appreciate both great athletes and great musicians yeah it's also beautifully short it's just so funny very intense the ending is incredible yeah and it's just such a feeling that you can always put on i think so yeah love this one a lot then this one we talked about on the podcast it's Aki Kaudis Mäki's The Other Side of Hope, his second to latest film, and he talked about how he was going to retire after this one, but then he didn't. But um, yeah, it's about immigration. It's about kind of the, like, it obviously was made after the quote unquote migration crisis here in Europe. So it tackles lots of heavy hitting. Uh, topics like racism and xenophobia and then kind of the all the bureaucracy in the immigration system here in Finland and in Europe and but it's also about kind of hope and human connection how can we see this Syrian refugee connecting with some Finnish people but then we can see the harsher side when we see these neo-Nazi racists feeding him up and stuff so I think it's a good mix of some hope but also not getting away from that harsher side of things. Yeah. But very beautiful and funny film as well. But if you want to learn more about it, you can watch that first episode of SJS Recommends. Yeah. Then we have Sion Sonos Love and Peace, another film that we will talk in the podcast. This has this great song called Pika Dawn that I love to sing. Toki o rimpi kuni mukete, kono kuni wa, don don yutaka ni natekyn. Yeah, I leave more of that song to that podcast. I'm gonna sing the whole song when we talk about this on the podcast, which probably will be fairly soon. But this is like if Sion Sono made Wes Anderson film. I mean, he made like a Wes Anderson film, like you can see from this shot. It's very Wes Anderson like but it's all about kind of becoming a music star and the effects of that for your personhood and stuff so very relevant topics and it's such a fun and insane film although it's very insane in like different way than most other Sion Sono films but such great fun yeah then we have burning another film that we're gonna talk about on the podcast soon i just got this on blu-ray i saw it in the cinema when it came out and I was absolutely blown away by it. It has like beautiful digital cinematography. It has great performances, great, very interesting characters, lots of ambiguity and mystery in it, lots of visual symbolism and it's based on a Haruki Murakami short story, which I might actually read if we end up doing this for Assets Recommends. I think it's a very short, short story, I think so. Yeah, probably will be very easy to read it, but we'll see. But yeah, such a great movie from my favorite South Korean director, so yeah, Lee chang Do. Then we have Hamaguchi's Happy Hour that I just watched. This is a five-hour movie, a very slow-paced movie. It's about this, again, four women and their lives together as friends, but also their personal lives outside their friendships. And this film is all about communication different types of communication and then how we communicate with other people how can we be ourselves when we communicate with other people and yeah the problems of kind of articulating your thoughts and emotions and things like that great performance it has that kind of very naturalistic vibe to it just like Hamaguchi films in general have and he was influenced by Eric Rome and Casavetis, for example, to other directors that I really love. But this is probably the slowest paced Hamakuchi film that I have seen, as there are these like very long scenes where pretty much nothing happens, just, it's just characters talking. And one of the parts I found really interesting is that one of these women yeah, wants to divorce her husband, but then the husband doesn't want to get a divorce, and then there's these scenes in the court when they're trying to figure all that stuff out and then we slowly learn more about the husband we see him as a very toxic 
version button, we cannot get to learn more about these motivations when the plot goes on and on and develops. So it's, that's part of well, like very interesting to me, and there's lots of emotions there and repression and interesting commentary about relationships and marriage. Yeah. Yeah, such a beautiful, great work. Yeah. Highly recommend it. It's on Criterion channel currently. Then we have Hong Sang Su, who is also very Eric Rome like and Hamakuchi like director. So this is Oki's movie, one of his films where he can really plays with the structure. It has these kind of different weakness that's about and this woman and her two relationships, one with this older yeah, professor and then a fellow student. And then we are kind of always kind of a bit unsure that all right. When did this and this like scene happen? Because it's kind of again a non-linear narrative. And it doesn't really tell you when this or that happened. You're gonna have to guess a bit with the structure, which is very interesting. But nothing much happens. It's again these characters talking and hanging out and but I love that type of cinema. So yeah. Great performances as well, interesting dialogue, and I love this type of low-key relationship stuff. Then we have Parasite, not much to say here as it's been talked to death, but um, it's not wanted to show it anyway, so yeah, I'll just go back. Yeah, I guess my internet is um, doing something crazy at the moment. Well, now it works, so yeah. But yeah, Bong Shun Ho's Parasite. Um, so I saw this in the cinema just before the pandemic happened. I think th this was actually the last film I saw before the pandemic. So it was in February 2020. And I had such a great time in the cinema. Although I haven't seen this scene, so I wonder how well it will like will like um hold up after that. But I'm one of the people who could kind of can understand both of the families. I didn't really hate any of the characters obviously i think it portrays all the people in that kind of with the shades of gray and doesn't necessarily take a strong side anywhere although of course with the rich people like the man says that yeah when you go to the subway and you smell the poor people or something yeah, so, that, so there are those kind of small moments of things like that and then when the Again, this character stabs the rich guy. I mean, that feels like kind of like a yeah, working class revolution against the rich people. And back then, I was kind of like, yeah, I wasn't a fan of that scene in a way. But now, in retrospect, I I kind of like it. Yeah, but I guess that kind of shows how my politics have changed throughout the years, anyway. So yeah. But yeah, beautiful cinematography as well. It's a good kind of genre bender in a way that it's very comedic, but also very dramatic. It has those thriller and even horror type of elements that all work really well together, which isn't easy to do. And also the film, The House Made by Kim Ki-young, that this was, that inspired this movie. is really good and worth seeing if you haven't seen it. So yeah, but great movie. I think it's, Slightly overrated. I don't think this is like the greatest movie ever, but I still really love it. I'm looking forward to watching it again. Then we have two Petro Costa films. I, I think I will talk about these together, kind of, because they are very similar films. So we have Vitalina Varela and then Horse Money. Um, so these are all about like the immigrant ex experience and how hard it is, how you feel trapped, how there are these kind of walls around you that you cannot escape, how you are kind of confined into this, this type of this type of life and how it's really hard to move on and how it can be hard to kind of integrate into the society, especially when the society is against these immigrants and it doesn't the society doesn't really help you to integrate properly. Yeah, but beautiful cinematography in these films. I love the kind of the shadows, the, 
the kind of very dim lighting where where many of the scenes are very dark but there's enough life to kind of create this interesting contrast yeah pretty much nothing happens in these films there are very kind of theme and aesthetic driven there's really no plot so obviously many people are turned off by that but i, I really don't want a plot i want themes aesthetics and a good vibe that's enough for me so yeah and again horus money is a very similar film so yeah but horus money came before vitalina varela and again they are pretty much equal in my head so my my two favorite petro costa films then we have another South Korean film, it's The Man From Nowhere by Lee Young Beom. And I've talked about this as well. It's a fairly actually a generic kind of action thriller about a kidnapping. And then this guy goes after the kidnappers as he wants to save, save this kind of young girl who is kidnapped. And as the young girl is pretty much the only character that the main character has any connection to so that's why he wants to save her but there's really nothing new in this film it's a very generic plot but it just does that type of plot as good as one can so that's why i love it and there's and i think this film packs like such an emotional punch as well that many of these films don't that that you really connect to these characters you can feel their pain so that's why i kind of love this film more than many other films like this I really think the action scenes are really great as well, quite brutal. And the villains are like really, really horrible people. Yeah, really as horrible as like villains can be, basically. So you really want them to get killed. Yeah. And of course, there is this kind of. Okay, there are also cops here, so they bring a new dynamics that there is this. Okay, this guy who's like an ex like military guy I, if i remember correctly ex yeah former special agent and he goes after the kidnappers but then there's the police going after the kidnappers as well and then the police are after this ex special agent agent as well so there's this kind of trio of different kind of um groups yeah but yeah great great movie great movie the ending really hits you as well then we have another Lantimos film, this one I saw in the cinema, although I haven't seen it since, so again I desperately need to rewatch it, but it's The Killing of uh, killing of a Sacred Deer, another film starring Colin Farrell, this also stars Nicole Kidman and Barry Deokan. But yeah, this is a very Kubrick-like film, both in terms of the cinematography, but also the vibe. And I think Kubrick was also a director that, again, when many of his films, they aren't comedies, but if you can really get into the films, you can actually find lots of humor in there and comedy, like even Paths of Glory. It's a war film that makes you hate the system, but at the same time, if you really pay attention to the dialogue and how the people deliver it, there's actually lots of humor in there in Kubrick films, even in something like Paths of Glory. But I think Colin Farrell is absolutely amazing in this film. Again, that Kubrick influence cinematography is very clinical, but beautiful in that clinical, methodical way. And this is also just another great genre bender of dark humor, kind of that thriller and horror, horror element. Get, gets very dramatic, at times very intense. But yeah, I really love this movie, and hopefully it will hold up on a rewatch as well. Been meaning to rewatch it for a long time, but I haven't. And the next one is another film that I need to rewatch. It's Steve McQueen's Shame, starring Michael Fassbender. But it's about this man okay, living in New, New York, but, but he has an addiction to sex. So it's a very kind of um, a very dark film. It feels like very clinical and cold. As this person's life is very cold, as he just turns into sex, he doesn't really have much emotion he's very repressed and has these very big emotional problems so this is a film that's very hard to watch but it's just done so greatly with just the, okay, the clinical cinematography great performances the cold vibe vibe of it and yeah very interesting character study type of film yeah 
Then another one that I really need to rewatch. I have had the Criterion for quite a while, but I still haven't watched my Criterion copy. I watched it before I ever got the Criterion, so I actually haven't seen the cut in the Criterion, which I believe is a bit longer than the normal cut. I, I don't remember. But this was a film that I was kind of skeptic, yeah, skeptical to go into it, as I'm not a Brad Pitt fan, and I kind of dislike Sean Penn as well. But then I ended up liking Liking the film a lot, obviously, it, one of Malik's most beautiful films with just absolutely incredible cinematography as expected. Very interesting structure and the way it's kind of built is very, very interesting. And again, many people won't like it as it is quite, quite weird and different and off-putting in a way. But it's such a beautiful film if you can get into the pacing and the visuals and stuff the vibe yeah i really need to rewatch this another one that i really need to rewatch is park chan wook's handmade and i watched it pretty shortly after it came out i think i actually watched it in filmstruck which was again criterion channel before the criterion channel and i believe there are a couple of different cuts of this as well so i don't remember which cut i watched but I was blown away by this film, how the plot was structured, structured and I was blown away by all the kind of the transgressive nature of this film. Again, that's what Park chan Wook tends to do. Love the performances, the vibe, the, the cinematography is incredible as, it, as usual in Park chan Wook films. But I don't remember this well enough to talk about it. That well, but again, need to rewatch it. I mean, my rewatching list is so huge, and that's why, like I said, okay, my list might be completely different if I rewatched all the films that I need to rewatch from this list. Then we have Drive, which is kind of a, like a nostalgia pick for me, as this was one of the first artsier films that I ever watched. It was probably the first kind of artsy film that I ever loved. And yeah, I still love the cinematography a lot, the vibe, the soundtrack is absolutely killer. I kind of dislike Ryan Gosling to me. His good looks are the only thing going for him. I don't really like his acting in general, but he is pretty good here. Uh, but I really don't understand how people are so infatuated by him. Yeah, and Nicholas Winning Refn is in the director that I I'm that interested in, I kind of disliked Only God Forgives, such a juvenile and stupid movie, even though, again, technically it was good, the cinematography and stuff, but the character, characters were just insufferable and stuff. But Drive is it's just a very entertaining movie, it's a good kind of combination of entertainment and then that kind of archier style. I don't think that's a, this is a very like deep movie, but aesthetically it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what I will think about this if I watched it today, but I think due to the nostalgia, I will still love it a lot. So, but I've seen it so many times, yeah. Once upon a time in Anatolia, so these last films are kind of near favorites. So these aren't my, on my all-time favorite list, but I feel like this will be after a rewatch, as it is already very close. But it's Nuri Pilche, Ceylans, again, Once Upon a Time in Anatolia, which is often kind of ranked as one of his best films, if not his best film. But it's this kind of police film, this three-hour slow cinema film of that, so very different. And Ceylan is a director who... Like he's such a good director in building up like characters slowly. We learn a lot, a lot about them through that dialogue and yeah, and his films are really beautiful looking. We have these absolutely incredible shots and lots of long takes and okay, the pacing is very slow. Not much happens, but the characters are great and again okay, the visuals keep you interested. Yeah, and I think we are also going to talk about this on the podcast. By the way, I know Altes has the Ceylon set. I think he mentioned that. So, yeah. Great film. Then, last but not least, is An Elephant Sitting Still by Hubo, who sadly killed himself after making this film. 
And as you can see from the shot here, it's a very bleak movie. It's all about kind of Chinese society. It's a very nihilistic movie in terms of how, how the characters are, also kind of the whole vibe of it. It's just kind of full of blown depression and oppression throughout the whole runtime. And it's a very long movie. Yeah, I think it's like yeah, four hours, about four hours long. So it's not an easy watch. And I totally get if people are, are like when they watch this that yeah, it was a great film, but I'm never gonna watch it again. Yeah. But the cinematography is great, even though it's again very bleak and oppressive. It has some kind of Pelatar vibes, even though it's quite different in many ways as well, but it has that kind of same type of darkness in it. But yeah, it doesn't really paint China in a, in a good light. Yeah. But such a great, great, great movie. I need to rewatch this one as well. But again, that was my top 25. Again, the order is something that could be very different. And I need to rewatch many of these films, like I said. But anyway, let me know your top 25 favorite films of the 2010s. Also, go watch Solitary Rowling's Spear. So Solitary Rowling's video if you haven't seen it already. Thanks for watching. Don't drink coke at all. Sayonara and arigato gozaimasu.